feel like Kobe in the fourth quarter. This is the Dane Moore NBA podcast. We're brought to you by Prize Picks coming at you late Tuesday night after the Wolves 122 108 loss in their first of two games uh, in Portland against the Blazers out here in Portland. Uh, I'm here with with Kyle Tige, and uh, we're going to give some immediate reactions to to game one of this two game set uh, against the Blazers. Kyle, it was 21 turnovers for the Wolves. Uh, the defense was pretty clearly a rotation behind the whole time. Blazers had 12 threes in the first half. Um, it was a it was a struggle on that side of the floor, and then really just kind of energy and focus. Did, did not seem to be there. I mean, choose your adventure. Which which one of those uh, three do you want to start with from this game? Well, welcome to my office. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, it was, uh, it's the exact type of performance you didn't want to see happen after the performance you saw on Sunday, right? Like, even, I think, pregame Finch referenced it. 88-80, four minutes left in the fourth quarter on Sunday against uh, an undermanned Heat team. You blow it because you don't execute. You do all the little things wrong. And then you come on the road. It's the NBA Cup year two. And uh, against another team that had a really, I mean, if you don't follow the Blazers much, they got beat by like almost 40 at home on Sunday by an undermanned Grizzlies team. So both teams kind of, you know, rock in a hard place. You knew the Blazers were going to bring it. You thought the Wolves would bring it. And then that first quarter, what, 28 to 17, they had no energy, no flow. The starting lineup continued to press all the wrong buttons. There's no real chemistry between those five guys. Um, and like I said, it was an 11-point game after the first. And then it just kind of was an 11-point game the rest of the way, right? Like every yeah. time the Wolves would kind of fight back, the Blazers would stop. And then you just kept looking up and it just kept being a 13-point lead. So... It was one of those games where I think they actually just lost the game in the first quarter and they couldn't really ever find their way back. Yeah, which I, I think was a, a bit of a surprise that, you know, there wasn't the response. I, I do think we talk about like the, the Finch era or the Ant era when unfortunately there's been a lot of like just what the heck losses yeah. over the yeah. course of time. But, but typically the response is to respond. And and that was definitely my anticipation coming into this game. I don't know. I I watched that Blazers Grizzlies game this afternoon, and I did not I did not anticipate the 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 Blazers coming out and and having any sort of energy. And I I I really don't think they did. I think the Wolves gave them energy. Absolutely. And 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 that was to me that was that was a product uh, of the turnovers. The Wolves were they came into tonight. 23rd in turnover rate or eighth most eighth most frequent turnover team and then they have 21 turnovers i mean crazy ones like four on inbound passes uh that randall eight second violation comes to mind i mean just just sort of sloppy stuff surrounding turnovers and i i don't know as much as as much as defense has been part of this team's identity like the underneath that the a big part of their identity over the past couple of years has been frequent turnovers and in this sort of way just just sloppy ones what how much of that how fair is it to keep pointing to you know new roster do anything or just the fact that they're not locked in and, and doing that part of it honestly after tonight's performance being in being in the arena right obviously they're out in portland for this two game set i don't think you can accredit any of that stuff to like having new guys trying to figure out the best five of these eight starters they have. I think I fed you. I want to correct this quick, but I think I fed you a bad number. I think it was 23 turnovers total tonight. Oh yeah. And the third straight game of 20 or more turnovers. Crazy. Credit to our guy, Alan Horton. Um, the longest 20 plus turnover streak since 1995 for the Timberwolves. That was a really bad time uh, in the history of the Timberwolves. And to have to kind of go back to that is, is frightening, but when I think of 23 turnovers tonight, I don't, there was a lot of times, right? I think Rudy, Dante, and Jaden all had four. And they were trying to feed Rudy on so many, like kind of drive and kind of give dish to him. And he, he dropped some of them and they weren't good passes. But the ones that stick out to me was like the eight second violation where Julius Randall has no urgency getting the ball across the timeline. Uh, how many times did they not inbound the ball right? Like those aren't things that have anything to do with having new coworkers or not being familiar with one another. Those are just literally not even like lack of 
attention to detail. There's no detail involved in that at all. And those were just boneheaded plays that, to your point, I don't know, tomorrow, they were, they were nine-point favorites tonight, right, against this Blazers team. They're nine-point favorites again tomorrow. I think they just gave Portland all the energy they could want by just giving them free stuff. Here, you know, Here's an inbound pass, and here's a free layup. And they did it time and time again, and they just kept shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah, it, it wasn't all Ant. I thought some of the loudest turnovers were Ant. A couple of those sure. inbounds were were him and just kind of trying to lob it over the, the top of somebody. Uh, we, we asked Ant after the game uh, about the turnovers and, and what he, you know, what he kind of prescribed that to. Well, we had a bunch of fun turnovers. What, what was behind those those turnovers? It seemed a lot. I of wish like I could tell you. I, I had no clue. I mean, I'm about to watch them from where Eddie sent to me, so I got I got to see it. Cause did it feel like focus? I don't. I can't even really tell you, bro. I don't. I don't know. Cause half of the time I was running down the court and then I looked back. They got the ball, so right. I just got to I got to watch it because I didn't see. It. I couldn't see him. I was down the floor. They would just turn that bitch over and I. So we just gotta see it, man. We just can't we can't turn it over, especially when we get stops. Like we get we make great defensive we have great defensive possessions. We run and then we turn over, then they running back. So, you know, that shit just it hurt us. I think I think they need a greater urgency from Ant surrounding just being locked in. And and it was probably one of my favorite things about Ant's start to the season. Um or even even kind of actually last time they played Portland, which was the day after they played Chicago. And that was felt like the Chicago game was the first game that it really started feeling like a regular season game. It lacked that urgency. And and they they seemed like a team that was, you know, allowing themselves to make those those type of mistakes. But I was impressed with Ant in the first quarter of the the Portland game after Chicago, he had that urgency and, and, and he was locked in from, from the jump of that one. He said the night before in Chicago, like this is on me early. We got to go right away. And, and what I think I'm noticing from Ant is he's, he definitely has that gear and he's been in that gear more this season. It, when his shot isn't going early, which has been the story of these last two games, the, the heat game and this first Blazers game, the, the seem, he doesn't seem to get that energy behind it. And when he's kind of in more of his lethargic energy state, that's when these mental lapses seem to happen. And the turnover, the crazy, again, I keep saying that, the crazy turnovers of just, you know, making a lazy pass here and there. And what I think this team needs from Ant is to be able to, at least sometimes when he's not playing well, his shot's not there, he's not getting to his Ant stuff easily to still be a mentally engaged player who's still helping this team in other ways. It's certainly not, or at least just not, you know, not hurting it. And, and I thought, yeah, I, I thought tonight he hurt them when he wasn't able to, when he kind of started the bleeding and wasn't able to stop the bleeding with, with some of that stuff. Yeah. It's an interesting time now, right? Because I don't think he was the worst player of the eight tonight. Uh, I think the coaching, I think Finch again had some miscues. I think Chris Finch right now is a guy, this isn't even like apologetic. I think Chris Finch is a guy who knows he probably has a good team. Uh, and I, I know people listen to this might interject or contradict that, but I think this is a good team. He just doesn't know how to find it. It's kind of like there's this light at the end of the tunnel. He just doesn't know which tunnel to go through. So Chris Finch wasn't great. I didn't think Rudy was great. Devin Chenzo was really bad, but there is kind of this time where it's like okay if ant is the face of the franchise he is the guy and he said that after the bulls game then he delivered right he comes out on friday against the blazers and he delivers he played 37 minutes tonight and didn't grab a rebound yeah that's not okay like that that's the type of stuff it's like okay so your shot wasn't falling it hasn't really fallen now for a couple games it's kind of been off what else can you do right i mean i have seen other players on this team how else can you be consistent when you're not being consistent offensively and like you know we probably give Jaden too much of a pass when he doesn't get a rebound. Cause they're always like, well, he's out there defending the guy. There's no, there's almost like mathematically no way that Anthony Edwards can play 37 minutes of a 48 minute game and not grab a rebound. Right. I mean, I know Portland shot almost 60% from three. There wasn't a lot of misses, but that's just the type of stuff where, you know, if you're, if you're the guy with the shoe in the movie and you're the face of the franchise, like it's kind of like the quarterback thing, right? Like you get all the praise when you win, but when you lose, it kind of falls on him his energy in that first quarter was just non-existent 
And I think guys like Nikhil tried to pick up some of that energy. I thought Jaden had maybe his best game of the season, which again, low bar, but he played really well. I think it was eight for 10 from the field. But if he doesn't bring it, and then Julius, who had a really bad night tonight, like seven, three, and two or whatever, if those I mean that's kind of the head of the snake, right? And if those two guys don't bring it, having this awesome bench with Na or Nikhil or even DiVincenzo, who was bad tonight, like it doesn't matter. Like you still need those two guys, especially and to bring it. And you could tell almost 45 seconds into that first quarter that he just kind of was just, you know, cardio pick up. Yeah. I, I would put it on. I mean, yeah. I mean, Jaden did play well and Julius didn't, but they're not, they're not star players, superstar players. And, you know, like, Finch like he talked was, about those lapses after the yeah. game. And I thought that was a, a really interesting thing. Cause you asked Finch like, Hey, you know, he is a star player. Now. Like he is one of those guys. He's, you know, a top 10 player in the league, but he still has those lapses. And like, what's the next step or like, what does it take to elevate to this other level? And I think Finch kind of summed it up perfectly. Yeah. I'll play that clip right here. With Ant, you know, he, he's had lapses before, but it seems like maybe you guys had ways to kind of survive the, those lapses. What as type he, of lapses are you referring to? From Ant, you know, execution, uh -huh. on execution, some of the things that you were just saying there. I mean, do you have the ability to cover up for some of that, or as he just ascends, does that just need to go away to win? Well, I mean, to win at the highest level, all those lapses need to go away for, to, for everybody, not just him, you know. Um, you know, and in the beginning of the game, we just we had a lot of defensive lapses where we weren't kind of breaking off enough and pick and roll and that kind of stuff. Um, things that we've talked about needing to do. So. I do wonder, you know, where where this team can go if Ant is going to have some of that somewhat understandable volatility of a of a twenty three year old. Um, as Finch said right there, to win at the highest level, like you have to get rid of all of it, win a championship. And and I guess that's why I, I, the glass half full of that is I, it's a good thing that there's 71 games left. Which is a constant theme in the locker room yes. post game. Mm -hmm. And there, there, there's time to, to find some of that. I, I just, I was really encouraged by Ants like first, seven games of the season and because the the biggest the biggest frustration if you watch ant if you've watched every single anthony edwards game and particularly the the first handful of years of his career he was like i don't know maybe one in five games he just wasn't there and that's clearly de that volume is of that is clearly decreasing um over time but it is an interesting proposition with this group of like how much of that can you afford from ant um, I think you probably could have afforded it a little bit more last season when there was, he was more like at the top of the tree, but now he's like the star on top of the tree. You know, he was up there with Kat and with Rudy and the, the other guys. And I'm curious to see when that like really sinks in for him. And, 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 and if there's that feeling of, you know, if I'm not here at the frequency that I need to be here, then we're not going to where. I expect us to, you know, to be able to go. And I think that like, it needs to be in internal from him. He's obviously getting the feedback from the vets. He's obviously getting the feedback from Finch, but at one point, you know, is, is that consistency, you know, self-started um, in, in him. And, you know, I'm not saying Ant's having a, a terrible year or anything, He's certainly having a, you know, a very impressive offensive season, but when I think about where this team could go, I, I, I think about, the consistency of Ant and the sharpness of Ant having the chance to, you know, rewatch the Miami game <laughs> since, <laughs> since the, uh, you know, since the time we did our, did our last pod, you know, a ton of that Miami game, the last four or five minutes of it, the things that went wrong, not just in the last nine seconds, but the, the sloppiness in that was on, was Ant too. And um, I guess this, t what I'm trying to say is this team can't afford to get like, even 28 good minutes from Ant if the other 10 are, you know, he's he, he's not there. Yeah, and, and I agree wholeheartedly. I also don't think they can afford it now because of all the other small issues. Like, when I went, it was really cool for me to just be around the team for 24 hours because, like, you get to kind of diagnose things, and I don't think they have cancer. 
I just think they have a bunch of illnesses like colds and flus and COVID and stuff. Sure. Um, but because last year when Ant did have a lapse, they could lean on a little more veteran presence. I mean, Mike was giving him good minutes and, you know, Kyle obviously struggled early on, but he at least had, was an adult out there when Mike would come out. And then you had the continuity factor and just, you know, having Carl there. I don't, I don't think this is like, well, now they're six and five because they don't have Carl, but they just they had other things that were a little more proven and a little stronger that when Ant did have that lapse and didn't show up in a game, like you could make it work. They need him more right now because they have so many other wounds and illnesses that they're trying to bandage over. Um, some of that, I mean, I think Nas referenced it, Nikhil referenced it. Just they love having DiVincenzo and Julius on the team, but it's it's those guys play basketball. I think we're learning this, right? Like since like significantly different. Like they jump passing lanes a little more. They're aggressive. Like they do things that maybe the rotation didn't do last year. So yeah, again, I, I don't I don't think it's fair to say that they lost that game tonight because of Anthony Edwards, but I also would not be shocked if a team that what 72 hours ago or five five days ago mm-hmm. beat this team pretty handily and did it the right way kind of just assume that, Hey, we can kind of take our foot off the gas tonight and they didn't have to worry about it. And they did have to worry about it. And again, that stuff does to the quarterback analogy, like he gets all the credit when things go well. I think you got to give some of the blame because, and he, he copped to this a little bit after the game too, but it's like, you are, he is the straw that stirs the drink, right? It's not Jaden. It's not anyone else. Like, he is the straw that gets that bitch spinning. And if he's not showing up, which he didn't tonight in that first quarter, uh, again, not only the zero rebounds thing in 37 minutes, but I think it's like two assists. Like that's just a player who is not making really any other impact uh, on the game. And when you're not doing that, it just kind of trickles down. Yeah. Uh, I think the, you know, I got the box score up right here. I mean, the, the telling thing right here is he's a minus 20 in, in 37. Game where Jaden was plus two. Yeah. I mean, you go through the starters, Jaden's plus two, Julius Randall's minus six, Rudy Gobert is minus seven, Anthony Edwards is minus 20, Mike Conley's plus seven. Um, the bench was the, the bench was ineffective too. I mean, from a plus minus standpoint, Dante DiVincenzo was also minus 20. Nas was minus 15. Nikhil was minus 13. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, how many, how many games are the Wolves going to win this year that Anthony Edwards is as the worst plus minus on the team? I mean, I think the answer probably zero, right? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's and you, and you get, you know, I think part of the, when you really dive into like just the box score of it, it's like, okay, so Anthony has two assists and like, zero rebounds whatever uh how many games are you gonna have where rudy and Jaden combined for eight turnovers right like that was just i think again a a, mm-hmm. a result of there's so little flow or the ball's not moving what did finch say post game about how do you kind of get out of this a little bit and he brought up the s word right like i think we might have to have more structure yeah. uh that might be the thing they do like maybe they have to get away from some of you know, finch always wants to play a free flow style of basketball but maybe they have to add in a little more bumpers for this team right now as they do navigate this whole eight starters thing. Because again, tonight, I mean, DiVincenzo was a great example of watching a guy play basketball, but yeah, he wasn't, I mean, he made everything in the preseason and he's made nothing basically in the regular season so far going through a pretty cold shooting slump, but uh, just these guys, they're all trying to pull these different levers and no one can pull three levers in a row. That makes sense. You can see little glimmers of like, the old Timberwolves, right? Where they can get an 8-0 run, but then they just give up a 10-0 run right away. And that's not what they did last year. On this really positive note, should we tell everybody about the live show we're doing <laughs> this Friday at, uh, at at Treasure Island uh, Resort and Casino? I mean, I've, I've done this read a bunch. Do you want to, I mean, you're going to be there. Do you want to yeah, talk dude, a little bit? Be awesome. Like again, tonight it's the cup. It matters more unless you're the Minnesota Timberwolves and it didn't matter to you at all. And they get upset. Um, but oh, by the way, just shout out to our Pistons who did win tonight in the cup. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be awesome because it's game two of this NBA cup. We talked to the players tonight. It means a lot to them. They, they enjoy the extra competitiveness. I think Friday night, uh, obviously the Wolves play on Wednesday against Portland, but Friday night game two of this NBA in season tournament. And I think it's gonna be really fun to just be around fans like that. That was the thing I missed tonight was I wasn't really on social. Like, what did I what did I not get to hear? So come to Treasure Island on Friday. We tried to set this up on a Friday so people could like come down, maybe grab a hotel, stay before all the snow comes. So come to Treasure Island. We'll do a live show. We're going to try to integrate as much fan feedback and Q&A and all that stuff. And then unlike other live shows you and I have done, we're just going to watch the game with everyone that shows up. So if you want to just bother Dane for two and a half hours about rotations, like 
this is the time to come. Parlay Lounge at Treasure Island on Friday, November 15th. It's going to be a great time. It's a late tip, 9 o'clock against the Kings. But, yeah, you know, come on down. Use promo code DANE, I think, to get 15% off a hotel room. Yeah, uh, so the schedule for the night is is we'll, we'll be there doing like a happy hour at 7. I think we'll start the live show a little bit before 8. Um, and then the game is at 9 p.m. If you do want to get a room, listeners to the show uh, can get 15% off. Um, and you do that by calling one eight 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 six seven seven eight two nine. Men- again, mention code uh, Dane. That's all in the show notes as well. Um, but yeah, this coming Friday, November fifteenth, at Treasure Island Resort and Casino. For more information, visit ticasino.com. Today's show is also brought to you by Your Home Improvement Company, um, and it's time. It's 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 about to get cold. If you have uh, if you have a job that you need to get done. Um, at your at your home and uh, some sort of home renovation project, I uh, recommend uh, calling, contacting your home improvement company now. Uh, they have a deal going on windows. Get those done. They've got leaky windows. You know, before the uh, before winter really hits, they have a buy two get two free deal, and they also have a thirty percent off deal on uh, full bathroom renovations. It's going to be a simple shub, a tub to shower uh, renovation or or a full uh, or full bathroom remodel. Um, if you are interested in working with your home improvement company or you have home renovation needs, we'd love it if you did it with YHIC. You can contact YHIC at 866-777-YHIC or go to yourhomeimprovementco.com. Your home improvement company where it's your home made better. Speaking of renovations. Yes, go ahead. Do you want to talk about the starting lineup? Sure. Yeah, let's uh, let's go there. Um I mean, jump it around, but like I was just thinking, no, no, like, no, no, no. I, that might I be something that. because I, I have been leading the pack of you got to give it 20 games. And I still stand by some of that stuff, but I thought you summed it up pretty well next to me tonight that this is the type of loss that can sometimes force your hand to maybe make a move a little earlier than trying to give it, you know, 25% of the season. Um, I think all five starters for the Minnesota Timberwolves this season are good basketball players. But there's just something lacking. There's just not a juice. There's something between those five guys that just doesn't really always make sense right now. And yeah, do you give it a little more time? Like, do you come back tomorrow again, nine point favorites, and clean it up and blow them out? And do you feel good about it? Or, you know, like, is there more of an underlying problem here with these eight starters? Are you starting the five right guys that you should be? Yeah, let's. Uh... I thought Finch's answer uh, to that was interesting when uh, Chris asked him about it after the game. Here's Finch when asked about making a change. Games, do you give like the starting lineup to try to maybe figure some things out? Because it seems like they're, at least at the start of games, sometimes not connected. Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, I didn't think, I thought the turnovers tonight were carelessness, not anything to do with connectivity. So. I don't know what to make of that answer of him not answering about a change to the starting lineup of if he thinks that means that's a stupid idea that he would make a change or that he's thinking about it. So he's not responding to it there. How, how did, how did you read that in the moment? I mean, he, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. I get what you're saying. And like, getting to know how Chris Finch talks in those situations. Yeah. I, I don't really have my big. like spidey sense going think, on. Yeah, I don't know how to decode that one. Uh, it, and he's, he's taking a lot of heat right now because again, even pregame before they get their asses kicked by the blazers, he said again, like Sunday's loss was almost all on me. All 48 minutes were all on me. They talked about that issue around two. They're like, he came into the locker room and was like, it's all on me. So Chris Finch's Q rating right now is low. They, they've thought about it. Like you, you would, you're being naive if you don't think that that coaching staff has thought like, do we have to pull a lever here? And to me, the lever that's the easiest to pull. And I said about this again, I know hashtags stick to sports, but there are politics involved in this. I don't think you can take Jaden out of the starting lineup. Again, I thought he was the second best player tonight, or maybe the best. He was really efficient, played good defense. Um, But what Nikhil brings off the bench with that energy, he was game ball tonight in a loss. Uh, well, all his teammates around he's got him, a room full of game balls at this point. I mean, he's having such an amazing season in a contract year, but to, to to look around and see all these other guys that aren't bringing, I mean, if one thing Nikhil's going to do, he's going to compete. And I don't necessarily think like Mike's not competing or any of this stuff. I just, I wonder if you, I mean, Nikhil's box score is not sexy. It's not going to blow you away, but 
I just, if you watch that game, he was one of the guys who was like, he was just digging into guys at 90 feet. Like he, I think maybe that would be the lever of. Then so it, I think that's a unique take on it. Like I, I don't, I think a lot of, people if they were to say change the starting lineup it would be conley out divincenzo well when i said to you i was like i think nikhil is gonna start soon you're like not divincenzo is like i think that was an interesting or you know a thought process i because i was watching nikhil play all those minutes and he was just bringing the thing that we just bitched about in the first segment that they didn't have from ant and julius right. was just attention to detail i mean he was yelling at rudy on a possession to like dig in which is like you normally don't think about that because rudy's so professional and always brings it so I just think it, it would scare me if it happens because I think Chris Finch still subscribes to the idea of having adults on the floor to help rein in some of the chaos. But I also just wonder too, like, do you just put a better player out there and try to maximize? I mean, you're still bringing off the bench, the sixth man of the year and Dante DiVincenzo, and maybe Mike can run more second unit stuff, or maybe it eventually gets to a Rob Dillingham thing. But Nikhil Alexander-Walker is having maybe the best season right now on the team and I think he deserves more minutes and it's easier to give a player more minutes by just starting. Yeah. I, I think, I think Jace's point was, was good about uh, yeah, it was. Mike. If just if Mike's going to play 24 minutes a night, which he is this season, he played 24, 17 tonight. Um, it's just easier to get a guy to 24 minutes. If you bring him off the bench. Um, and I don't, I think like, even if Mike started playing, like Mike played really well for the next six games, what does his minute total look like? 28? Right. Like, yeah. like they're not, that, that's not, there's not a, a dial. There's a limit to that dial. Right. And again, I, I do think, like I said to Jace the other day, like I, I think Mike at point guard doing something similar to what he did a season ago is the best version of this team. Um, but if I, if I were to, make a change or if I were to envision how Finch would yeah Jaden I don't think you can mess with that um nor should you I don't think yeah 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 no I'm just saying if, if there if there were different options I, I mean it's it's hard I'm not arguing against your Nikhil point but like I kind of like where Nikhil's at and that role is expanding out to you know high 20s sometimes he's getting the opportunity to close games like I don't feel I don't feel like starting Nikhil is going to change what I'm getting from Nikhil. I feel like if you were to start DiVincenzo in Conley's place, again, even if we're taking this pathway at all, I think you might get a different DiVincenzo than you've been getting. And I don't think, I mean, what would we grade DiVincenzo so far? What he's been, a C plus? Like, can you get the B plus version of DiVincenzo if you move him into the the, the starting lineup? Um, that would be the only, you know, change I could think of. But I think the bigger question here is, does some sort of change need to happen? I don't have the naming of what it is, but does it, does some sort of change need to happen to reconfigure this in some way to get just a little bit more back uh, on the track? And I think to me, the answer to that is yes. Like a, a change needs to happen. I don't know what it is. And then once I start playing out the possibilities for change, I don't totally love any, any of the options. Well, and they kind of, shit down their pants, shit down their legs a little bit tonight because if you could just win this game i mean then we wouldn't be having all these conversations about these concerns but then you could be like hey mike this year we're not playing you on back-to-backs or like at least early on so tomorrow night you could have experimented with starting Nikhil. and hell maybe they do that anyway um the when you're saying that though i also have been thinking this too and i i was i think it's because malik beasley hit the game-winning free throw for the pistons and so again shout out to our detroit pistons trying to get that pick but I wonder how much better Dante would play alongside Mike. Like if he had Mike running the second unit I like that take. Yeah. and I, again, we have pretty much hammered home. And I think this is true. Like this is not up for debate that they have eight starters and those three dudes off the bench in DiVincenzo and Nikhil and Nas are all really, really good. But now I'm starting to come around on the idea that maybe they don't all play super well together. Like let Dante just run around a bunch of screens and let Mike get him set up and then like have Nas as his tag team partner and then just play some athleticism with maybe Josh or you have Rudy out there or you keep Randall out there. So I get why I thought early in the season to put Dante in the starting lineup or when we were talking about this a week ago because of his shooting, but I'm not fully sure I need a ton of shooting. And Nikhil's confidence in his shot right now is great, but I have watched the team now 
multiple times, even before the Chicago Bulls speech or whatever, like just kind of lack a little effort. And Nikhil, you know what you're going to get. Like you can just sharpie him in and like he's going to at least bust his ass. And then maybe that'll get Ant from the jump going a little more. Maybe that'll get Jaden a little more. And then you bring in a second unit. I mean, Mike Conley in the second unit is the best second unit backup point guard in the league probably. You know, I, I'm glad we're talking through this. Um, I do think Mike would help Dante. And I think we could explain it away pretty easily of like, it is actually like Malik Beasley a couple of years ago. Like we know what this DiVincenzo role looks like in the Finch offense. It's no, it's, a, it's Beasley, right? Except Dante can do more things other than just be a, you know, be a shooter on like, but I want him to be Malik Beasley. I don't want him yeah. to be Mike Conley. I don't want him to run the point for this team. Exactly. And, and to make, to tap into Dante DiVincenzo's Malik Beasley part of his game, he needs a point guard feeding him off of pin downs off of those peel cuts off of um you know flare screens like it's those that's a timing timing and accuracy on passes to to a movement shooter to get them to convert the shot the pass is really important on that and i think a point i mean there, there's a level of you know understanding that stuff that mike conley is so 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 many levels ahead of ant or nikhil at and so I do think there's a logic in in putting Mike and Dante together more again, whether this is some sort of starting lineup shift uh, or not. But the more the more Mike you play with Dante, even this version of Mike, I think the better Dante play that you get. Well, when Nikhil was struggling, whether it be at points last year or a little bit in the preseason or whatever, like it was because he was thinking too much about trying to take on a bigger role and like play point guard. Yep. And I wonder for Dante DiVincenzo, who was guns blazing in the preseason, you go back and watch that preseason, though, it was really just a lot of score. And now he's kind of struggled in these first 11 games. And I wonder if he's got Nikhil syndrome where it's like he has to also be like, I got to play backup point guard. I got to do all this stuff. I really want DiVincenzo for like a month to just play like Malik Beasley on the court. Like just run around, like you said, run around these screens, get a bunch of shots up. He's a really good facilitator. Like, if they start to crowd him and you know come up to 30 feet, then he can get in and he can feed Nas. He can find Rudy. He's really good at throwing lobs. So again, and, may, and maybe none of this game is a starting lineup change. Maybe it's again, this goes back yeah. to like this idea of the, are there other ways to solve this puzzle and get the pictures to show right. up that you they want? don't have. I don't think this team, this is like my biggest takeaway because now people are really upset with this team and you know, losing hope 11 games in. That was the message from everyone. I don't think they have like cancer. I don't think they have this diabolical disease that's going to kill them but they have a lot of headaches and migraines and you no know, sore like they got a lot of things and it's just like maybe smaller tweaks to get different guys playing together because that's what finch is doing i mean you you know this like you can expand on this more than i can but chris finch and i think he's told people this too like i think chris finch and tim conley and everyone thinks this is a good team but i think they're a little shocked at the fact that they haven't been able to find the right levers and I think Nikhil and his energy and his toughness and his defense, because again, by the way, we're 40 minutes into this and we're talking about a team whose identity last year was defense. And we asked them tonight, like, what do you think your identity should be this year? And Nas was like, well, it should still be defense. It wins championships. Put Nikhil in the starting lineup, get more defense, get more energy, and then have a little more of a sophisticated second unit that is led by Mike Conley, who to your point is like still probably the best facilitator table setter on the team. I like that. I, I want to continue that into Nas and the defense point because that you know reminds me of uh, us talking to him him there. And you know, Nas has you know, look at this box score, and I'm like, man, this is probably an awesome Nas game to watch. Yeah. Right? He's got 28 and six, um, six for nine from two, four of eight from three. Like those are those are your favorite Nas read games, right? And and oftentimes when you get that stat line from Nas or something similar to that, they win the game. And and this one, like I'm not sure Nas was a positive in this game, even with that stat line. And I don't know if he thinks he was. <laughs> right. Like the so, I mean, well, rewatch the game, but in the moment, like so many of the first half defensive errors connected to Nas in, in some sort of way. They they made they were like 11 for 17 from three at one point. I think they got to 12 made threes. Portland did in the first half. 
And so many of them were like Nas a step late on the closeout. A bunch of Robert Williams, I think he was like five of six from the field in in his first stint out there, which was when Nas was out at the five. And so many of them were on getting the lob on Nas, getting a step on him, falling behind him. And it's really important for this team that if Nas is going to have this type of offensive game, that his defense can't sink his performance. And, and a lot of it is on Nas to execute and know his job and do his role. I am just wondering, like, what even a reasonable level of defense from Nas Reed is in this role on this team right now because, I mean, I don't know. Of the eight, is he an eighth on defense thus far this season? Just yeah, overall? but just keep cooking because you guys yeah. had an awesome interaction in the locker room, just mm-hmm. two really smart basketball players nerding out over, over defensive coverages. But <laughs> I think he, too, is – yeah. because – the the cynic would say Nas Reed is the longest tenure in Minnesota Timberwolf. He's been here the whole time. Finch has been here. Like he should get all this stuff, you know, continuity. Like that's part of the continuity. I think he is also like Julius, right? And like D Divincenzo, like learning new stuff, like learning new defensive things because he's kind of shifting around and playing different positions. And I thought that's kind of how you pose the question to him in the locker. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, last season. We saw Nas play good defense, but I mean, we saw him switch consistently on the perimeter. He was, uh, you know, his concerns last year about, oh my God, he's going to have to, you know, chase wings on the perimeter. And I mean, I thought Nas was, I mean, I don't think it was like some sort of lockdown guy last year, but he wasn't a defensive problem. And right. at times he, he, he fueled the defense. I am seeing many times this year while he's at the five and playing just in a different role that it's, that it's impacting him and his defense has been significantly worse. But yeah, I, I talked to him about it after the game. Here watching you guys play defense, it was frequent that you would be flying around and swarming to the ball defensively. That seems more infrequent this year. Mm-hmm. Is that what's behind that? Is it is it confusion with the schemes? Is that an effort thing? Like yeah. what, where where's the flying? I think it's a combination of both and then just understanding, you know, uh, the guy's next rotation, you know, uh, understanding that, you know, um, whoever Say the little man acts like I have to exile. You know, let's, it's new to you know Julius and Dante and stuff like that. And we're kind of trying to piggyback off of them and back and vice versa. So it's kind of a combination of both. Some of that's new for you to yeah. know that you're like the five. Like there's a couple times where it seemed like you wanted to stay by the yeah. rim tonight and you got to fly out there. Like mm-hmm. what's that 100%. like for you specifically? Yeah, like you said, I'm kind of like I've gotten to a position where I'm kind of used to switching and kind of you know I get caught you know up and being up in the pick and roll and my man get behind me thinking I'm in the switch situation or a high, a high wall situation. So it's kind of new to me as well. But um, just, you know, i got to have that mentality that I had last year, whether I'm playing the four or the five or, you know, just having that, you know, mentality where I got to, sometimes I got to switch schematic schemes or things like that. You know, I mean, so talking about there about needing to be aware of the different schemes and, you know, am I out there with Rudy, not out there with Rudy. Like we kind of know how that story goes. That was a mess the, you know, the first year when, that those are the things that Carl was saying, you know, when he was trying to figure out, he sounded like Carl a little bit. Yeah. Right. And I mean, the thing for me with Nas is defender. And if he was on another team that didn't have the best drop coverage five in the league, uh, you know, I mean, I think he would be on a, it would be, he'd be on a team where they're switching five all the time. It's just a switch defense. And he's, he's your five and, you know, he can guard three through five, you know, pretty well and even hold his own against, you know, a guard temporarily, like the best type of defense for Nas Reed, I feel like it's just switching. But you can't like, or they're not allowing themselves to go from the most conservative coverage ever right. with, with Rudy, right. right? To the most like aggressive, we're switching everything, you know? And that that is, that's not like a, you know, we talk about flipping the switch between what the coverages are. That's like turning off the whole power grid, turning back, like it's, that that's a that's a significant change. I just I don't know. I, I'm I'm not sure he's going to be able to be a a solid defensive five for for this team. In I, he he hasn't he hasn't been yet. And again, I know he can be a a solid defensive three and a good defensive four. I've I've, I've seen that a lot. Like, tell me about a time that Nasrid was a good defensive center. Like, 
Maybe at LSU. I don't know. I, I mean, the year. I mean, years ago when when we, the entire narrative, you know, before you know, six man of the year, Nas Reed, was you know, Nas can't guard, right? The right offensive right. guy, all offense, no no defense sort of guy, and then why he became a six man of the year is because he helped on both sides of the ball. He was he was a six man of the year on the number one defense and and helped that. I just the beginning of his career when he was playing center and he was just Carl's backup for 15 minutes a game. Like he was not a good, he was not a good defensive player and, and they're putting him, you know, they're putting him back in that. And I, I understand it's out of necessity right now, but it is, you're just going to get a lesser version. Uh, that's the, that's the, you're going to get a lesser defensive version of Nasri the more minutes you play at center. I, I think it's, it's, it's that simple. And I understand they, they need him to do that if they're going to play these eight guys, but um. I just thought it was a, I thought it was a bummer watching the game tonight and seeing him cook on offense and get cooked or the team get cooked on defense when he was out there without Rudy. Yeah. Um no pushback. That was really smart. I learned a lot. I do uh I do think to bring him back up that it would also and this is starting to show out a little bit more and there's still a lot of highs and still a lot of pluses, but there's some minuses. It would be nice if Julius could help too. Yeah, that's for sure. Right. right, like just defensively, because oh yeah, this is the, this all collectively goes yeah. on the both of them of the non Rudy minutes. Okay, I think that's just the clarity I want to provide. Is that this but is wouldn't you say that Nas is playing center like all the time when it's those two? Sure, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that you know, last year from the first year Rudy was here to the second year, there was that big leap, and your prediction a year ago was that Nas and Rudy would would be awesome, and, and it came to fruition. And this year now, when Nas plays alongside, by the way, just quick interjection because you brought this up zero minutes through 11 games of Nas, julius and rudy together yeah yep they haven't Nas has not played just any put a pin yet. in that i don't really have like a strong take on it i don't like it i just think that it would be again if, if we're starting to go into the like we're not ready to s switch up the starting lineup right but we should you know we're not ready to throw all the shit at the wall but let's just throw droplets like what will stick i would like to see those three guys play together yeah i mean and so maybe maybe to do it last year if you couldn't do it like it's not like you had five backup centers or bigs last year it's the exact same luca garza josh minot leonard miller stuff it's 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 Nas, carl and rudy and they had really cool minutes last year the three of them why can't you at least experiment with Nas, julius and rudy this season I, the, the answer to that of why they haven't i think is because Nikhil has played so well and so much sure and that's a that's another that's wing you know what i'm saying like if you go look at like Nikhil's game logs from the this time of last season he's playing like 12 minutes a lot of the time and and so they had more room you know there was a little just greater flexibility within their rotation to get to different things um because they did not have eight guys that they had to all play 20 minutes a night um i do think though if there is going to be some sort of quote unquote change, and we're all looking at like what starting lineup change, there are other ways to make like some change. And the two we didn't we didn't have it tonight, but in the two previous games, they played they played a chunk of minutes with Randall at the five and McDaniel's at the four. You know, it's just something different. It's a yeah. it's a smaller ball look. Um, do you want to go to the the three bigs look? And that that'd be something else that you could throw and just like and, and mix that into there to have a couple different identities. Actually, in the I mean, I know it was two minutes that Josh Minot was out there, but that was a really big group. Like Minot was at the two in right because it was it was Rudy, Rudy Nas, McDaniels, Minot, and Conley was yeah, out there. And you were really saying I wanted Ant out there yeah, in, the, yeah. in the Conley spot. I was like, that's really big. But it was I remember watching the, those handful of possessions and being like, oh, this actually just feels like in the amount of space occupied, it reminded me a little bit of last season because now you have six nine Josh Minot at the two rather than six foot three, you know, Dante DiVincenzo or something like that. I I wonder if, and I again as a coach, I don't know how hard it is to like disperse some of that, but I I know that you get there by having the attention of being like, we want to get to this at this time. We want to get to this at this time. And and maybe I don't know how they can't be sitting there and 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 think and like you said before, at least considering some sort of change, whether that be to the starting lineup or the rotation overall. Like it, it might be easier to get to different lineup combinations than it would be to make a, like a wholesale starting lineup change. I probably should have set you up for this 20 minutes ago, but 
this is cool for me. I was in LA. I got to watch that game firsthand experience. Like that team just didn't show up. LA, whatever game one, whatever. Yeah, man, um, you, you've got. Yeah, I'm on a heater right, right now. <laughs> uh, just life in general. Uh, but then this game, because the the conversation then graduates to expanding the rotation, right? Like everyone loves Rob. Everyone wants to see the you know the snow is not on the ground yet, so pull out the lawnmower. But I did this game, like just give me your yes or no or expand. Like this game, I didn't leave this game thinking this was about expanding the rotation. And again, I should have said this 20 minutes ago, but this is about trying to get the rotation guys right now, figuring out a hierarchy, figuring out better roles and combinations and stuff. I still think Rob is going to fold in, but like tonight was not a night that I was like, yeah, Rob Dillingham would have helped them. I think Rob's going to be the starting point guard of this team in the future, all that cool stuff. But like, Tonight, it was more about those eight guys, the guys we've been talking about trying to figure it out and not so much of, I don't know, like if Josh would have played 20 minutes tonight, who was Julius? Like, I mean, we just said Nas Reed was offensively the best performer on the, in the team and Jaden probably had the best two-way game and Nikhil was nails on defense and in energy. Like, where does Josh Minot get 20 minutes tonight? He doesn't. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know how any change to the rotation meaning the amount of players into it or a significant change in the minutes they are getting. I don't think that's happening. But I also, as I talk it through, think, and again, Rob. Like, it, it, look at that, dude. I'm like, okay, mine out one minute and 46 seconds. So we're going to give him 18 under. more minutes? Like, who are we killing? Like, you got, I, mean, I don't know. Like, what what, what do you, there's a math problem. Right. And, uh, but then I'm not, now my brain is just in a blender, but like, I go back to like the Nas stuff. I, I would kind of like to see maybe like a, a Josh Julius Nas, just like just having a little more size out there and rebounding and a little rim protection. Again, these are just, yeah. these are just those smaller levers, right? This isn't the big one that you mentioned earlier. This is just smaller levers of, I literally just said, I want to focus on figuring out these eight guys. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. And I'm going? also like talking on the other side of my mouth, but uh, yeah, I just, I, I think how they just got to make it work with this eight. Like, I think that's like, I the, think, and I think coming away from that is like, I agree. And people are so mad listening to this. They're those other guys are going to get opportunities. I mean, look at the West right now and what people are on pace for. I mean, the Pelicans. So have, I, I don't know, like what, what are, this theoretical people, person who's not theoretical. I, mean, I know they're, they're some on of those, the loose guy, but, but what, what, what do they want? Like, it, it, do they just, they want Dillingham to play or is there, is there a specific person that they want out or like change. Cause that that's the part, like, I, I don't know. We, we could, we'd walk our way through this. Like if you want my not to play even 15 minutes a game, what is the, where does that come from? If you want to give, I mean, you got to, if you wanted to give Dillingham run, I mean, you need to give him two, like you'd have to give him a six, seven minute stretch. You're not going to play him for a couple minutes. You know, you're going to have to give him two of those. That's 14 minutes, you know, like, what what does that come at the the cost of? And maybe sorry, so so answer that answer that first. Well, I will just say the last six minutes have made absolutely bonkers bullshit no sense to anyone listening to this. And I wonder <laughs> if is, that's what it is one a.m. in Portland. Which but now with that, I've just taken your really good podcast and thrown it off the rails. I kind of wonder if this is what like Micah and Finch are thinking about too. Sure, is that it's like oh my god, like this could kind of work. Like I, I don't think Chris Finch is anti Rob Dillingham. I, I do think that although I put a clip of him hitting three threes in a row today on Twitter, that I did cut the video for the six he missed before that. You know what I mean? Like I think there's. I don't know if he's ready yet. He's gonna be awesome, and he's a great kid, and he's dying to play. But I. The rotation thing is the big one now because when you are underperforming and you got guys like Mike who are off to a slow start or DiVincenzo's just missing all the shots, I mean, that's just what you would typically gravitate to is these players aren't playing well. Let's put in other players and give them a chance. I just don't believe that's the answer. I think Finch and you and I kind of all agree that they still got to try to hammer different levers here with these eight and then fold those other guys in. I also did tell Dane tonight that I think Joe Ingles should play. And I want to put that out there right now. I know it's late, but I did say that. I kind of, I don't know if I regret it. But yeah, I so we're playing my not 20 minutes. We're 12 now, yeah. We're, we're getting, we're, <laughs> we're giving Dillingham 15 and Ingles has got to be back out Chauncey there, ever so. gets fired, he can come play too. <laughs> Alumni, like I'm trying to get this bitch to 14. Uh, I, yeah, I just, 
but it is it's a fascinating it's a fascinating as you just kind of therapeutically talk about this i mean i know people are going to wake up wednesday and be bummed that they lost and pissed and all that stuff and i, I this is a different type of loss than sunday because i thought against the heat they battled and you know even the nuggets game right like they kind of stole that but they outplayed them for a long time same thing on Sunday against the Heat. They had an 88-80 lead. Tonight was completely different. Tonight was one of those losses, as you said at the top. Like, that kind of maybe forces you to maybe either make a change, and we wake up Wednesday, and they tweet it out, and it's a different lineup, or they're at least talking about it tonight, right, at the hotel of like, hey, if this happens again in a week or something against the Hornets or a bad team, we might have to move the cards around a little bit. You know what I think uh, one option would be? To, if you want to start making a change and get to whether it's th- our suggestions are different lineup combinations, right? Potentially different guys into the rotation, new ownership. <laughs> no, Wait, no, sorry, keep going. No, um, you could you could not play Mike tomorrow. I think that's an easy one, and and then that allows you to get to different things, like you know whether it be you want to kill with to play more at the starting group, as, as you suggested there, you want to get mine out out there for more size within the second unit. Okay. Now we got 24 more minutes to work with. Um, you want to get Dillingham 14 minutes. Like, I don't know if we could do all of those things, but you, you open it up more. I think, I think, and I've heard this part from the fan bases. And I think that that's the fairest gripe is in some of these back to backs, particularly with your 37 year old who's struggling that that might be the time to see if you can you can catch something else and you can find something else because to be fair to Josh Minot and even Joe Ingles, like what the fuck were they supposed to do in these four minute rolls to be able to get anything? You, you know, like how are they going to be able to catch some some sort of rhythm and be able to even stumble into something new? You know, like it was garbage time, but like Nasri had ended up being out there for, you know, three, four offensive possessions with Rob Dillingham that one time. And you go, huh? Oh yeah. You know, like, and, and I mean, my God, I'm pretty sure any Nas unit is going to get cooked right now. And so I don't think throwing Rob Dillingham out there with him is exactly the, you know, the, the, the thing that they, they need defensively, but um, I don't know. I, I did. I said like, two weeks ago, I think, or at least a week ago that I just felt like a change is ultimately going to, is going to, is going to happen here. I don't know exactly what it is. I still don't know that, but you said it best. There's, there's no way they can't be talking about this too. Yeah, it's late. Now you got me thinking like, I don't want to undersell how important Minnesota Mike has been to this whole thing. Sure turning around like the whole thing, right? Like the trade that saved the franchise, maybe in terms of getting him and Nikhil for D'Angelo Russell. Um, That seems easy. Second night of a back-to-back. This is no shade to a Portland Trailblazers team. That's full of young guys uh, and absolutely just whooped Minnesota's ass tonight. But like, they don't need Mike. You can just go get a look at the Dante with the starters. You can get a look at the Nikhil, which choose your, choose one of those two paths. Like you can, you can go get that, and then you can bring Mike back to play on Friday against against Sacramento. Right, but if it really hums, sure, then Mike all of a sudden kind of becomes like the scapegoat, <laughs> or like a little not the villain, but like you know if 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 Nikhil slides in tomorrow because it's like, hey, Mike, just like you and I, like you're 37 or whatever you're old, and you it's going to be Nikhil, man. I, no, 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 whoever it is, yeah, Mike, yeah. Mike, Mike, you, you, we're not playing you tonight. Like we're going to step in this season, and I know you our competitor and last year it meant a lot to you to play almost 75 games, but you're not going to play tonight. And then it really hums and Rob looks really good. Then it's just kind of like for a guy like Mike Conley, who has been very open and always does media and is always up front is like, I'm kind of struggling with, you know, like Mike Conley who does have children is like on a team now where a lot of the kids have their own driver's license and he doesn't have to bring them everywhere. And I think he's learning like empty nest syndrome of like, well, I don't have to do as much now. Like this is a little difficult for me to figure out. And if all the kids are thriving tomorrow night because he sits, I think that's like a probably at least something that like Pablo's brought up. Like, well, if we look really good without Mike, how do we then fold him back in on Friday? So again, just a random domino, but I think that's the easiest lever short term to appease everyone is that again, you're nine point favorites again on Wednesday. It's not the cup. I think they're changing the court at the Moda Center uh, overnight. But uh, 
just say, Mike, it's the second night of a back-to-back. It's a long season. It's game 12. So let's pull you out, sacrificial lamb, and then Dante or Nikhil, you're in. And then and then if Mike were to sit, you have to play someone else because you're not going to play a seven-man rotation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you then you choose if it's Minot or you know or Dillingham. I I get I would guess it or or maybe even Ingles there too. You know, um, but yeah, think that through and find your best process to to go to there and and then you know even start Mike again on on Friday or whatever. Um, and I, yeah, I think that's probably how they stumble into something if they stumble into something and. They will probably 16 hours from now tweet out the same five guys yeah. that started the rest of the season and people will be upset. And I, to put a bow on this, will probably give them a little more grace than your average fan, because I think Finch wants to give some of these guys as many opportunities as possible to try to get it to click. But tonight was an eye opening. And again, I kind of am a degenerate and I love losses in a certain way. Like tonight was an eye opening situation of like, oh, this is what it looks like when it's really bad. And you can't, you know, you can have this on November 12th or whatever. But if this happens again tomorrow or on Friday against the Kings and like becomes repetitive, tonight was the first time, game 11, we made it through 10 games, where it at least opened everyone's eyes to like, you know what? What got you to the party last year? I mean, remove Carl for a second, just what, what got you there last year might have to seismically change this year. If you want to get back. I was going to say something that I forgot. What were you talking about before that last thing you just said? I don't know. Were you thinking about the chicken dance song? <laughs> I was not thinking about the chicken dance I, I mean, song. just, 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 just I w- to summarize it. Like, I think they're unfortunately probably no, 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 no. politics. that goes into this mic stuff, man. I just, I, I, I don't think they want to just sacrifice him. I don't think they want to cut him or trade him. Like, no, you know, I think uh, I just, yeah, I, if, if they take him out tomorrow, that's the easiest lever to pull after all the lever references we've made tonight. <laughs> but um, I would do it. And again, we're doing this pod late at night. We'll see what happens tomorrow. If they don't do it, they can still win the game by 15. But you almost have like a cop out here of like, Mike, just chill for a sec. Like just sit out for this one. Let's try some other stuff. And then you'll learn more. But I, I, I do think Dane, you know, you got to give this team a little patience, but on the flip side, like you, what is the definition of insanity? Just doing the same shit over and over again. You don't want to be the insane franchise that 30 games in 40 games in oh, is still I know running the exact same. That's why I just wanted to ramble until you figured it yeah, out. Yeah. Thank you, Buster. Thank you. No. So you said, I think in 16 hours, we're going to say the same, see the same starting lineup, tweet it out. And it's going to be the same thing. And people are like, well, again, I, I think so too, but I would remind people of, 21 22 season right about i think it was about 10 to 15 games in that's when patrick beverly and jared vanderbilt got moved into the starting lineup and what was going on there remember that was like that that lineup had this the craziest net rating of all time and it was just it did get to a point where where finch rolled with the numbers and and made a change that not only statistically made sense on the sample that had just happened, but it also gave them more of an identity. And that's when that team started having the Pat Bev and Vando fly around identity. What this team doesn't have right now is an identity, but they do have some lineup combinations that have been awesome together. Yeah, exactly. And, and so I think what, what, what you're talking about is like Finch usually like you're like, we've been talking about this for a half hour. Finch normally just like doesn't change and you just kind of trust the process and it yeah. keeps it going. That is the example of a time he didn't do it. And that was very, that was a very good thing for that team that really caught a rhythm. And that was the year where they were the number one offense January on. Um, they found something there that they had little crumbs of before that they, that they pieced together. But that was a that was a roster that was very much in flux. Um, there wasn't as much of a political pecking order due to salaries and stuff yeah. like that. I mean, Nikhil Alexander Walker making four and a half million dollars a year, like he is, and starting for a team that's in the second apron, just that doesn't really line up. You know, you got a lot of expensive guys on this team that are expected to do to be playing at a significantly higher level. Nikhil is being paid to do what he's been doing you know so i don't know uh but, but we'll see if there's a change there 
what did, what did Finch say pregame? And like I, I thought it was just it was a cool day for me because like like I don't know what shoot well could no because shoot around it was still asking all the questions about what happened on Sunday and and Julius was pretty upfront that Finch like apologized to the team was like hey a lot of this was on me and I messed up and then Finch saying that he loves these guys like if everything we just said and he he has proven to be stubborn but then you have a really good example of when he flipped the script and wasn't stubborn uh I think those guys in the locker room ride for him and. If they, I mean, I think we're kind of underselling this as we wrap this up. That if they do eventually change the starting lineup, like that's big time news. Mm -hmm. Like that's like NBA jump stuff that they're going to talk about because once you do that, I always kind of, I made this analogy the other day about like when you're having a hitting slump in baseball. Like if you just had a bad series against the Cardinals, you're not just going to move from second to six in the order. Like they do kind of give you weeks to slump and then like, okay, now we're going to bring you down a little bit. Sure. That might be what Finch is doing right now. Just like, hey, we're not going to, we're not, you can't just pull these guys and start Mike on a Tuesday and then not start him on a Thursday. Like we got to get enough sample size now that this doesn't work is 11 games enough. I don't know, but right. maybe it is like, maybe that is the sample size of this is the rotation change, the starting lineup change. And then they take off. Cause like, Ant said too, I mean, he's the most confident person I've ever talked to, but I just think they know better than I do. And, you know, and they have a better, and they have a, better better feel for this and i know that's not like a a thing that most people like to do with sports they like to say you know this is a change that i think can and should happen if it doesn't it's it's dumb and it's not like finch is not capable of making mistakes like let's rewind 48 hours ago he made he made some some big mistakes but what i do know about chris finch is he has a hell of a better of a feel for his roster the politics of it and, and who plays best together than I do. He, he just, he just does. And um, I, 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 I think he'll make it a, a change if it's the right thing to do. And he won't, if it's the right thing to do, I, I, I'm not, I'm not in the, I'm not ready to put more on Finch other than he messed up the end of that end of that game um, against Miami, which, he he cops too as well. Uh, let's let's see what he decides. I'm I'm just curious to see because it would make uh, it would make sense to consider. I'm, I'm I'm curious to see what he decides. Let's wrap this thing up uh, with some prize picks. Kyle, um, did you pick yours from the the Thursday night slate, or what are you thinking for prize picks? Uh, there is a lot of good ones. Um, Thursday night is Eagles Commanders. I think that's what we call them now. Um, I had a. Uh, I had Jaden Daniels over one and a half passing touchdowns. Okay. Uh, I just think that game is going to be awesome. Like it's not going to be as awesome. Ooh, you got a, you got I know a little on demon, one. right? Horns up. Uh, it's not going to be as exciting as last Thursday's was. I know you missed that Ravens Bengals, but these Thursday night games can get a little wonky and a little loose. Not a lot of defense. Uh, I can't imagine playing two football games in the span of four days, but yeah, give me Jaden Daniels over one and a half passing touchdowns. And then I had to give me whatever McLaren's receiving yards are. I just think that it's going to be a little more of a shootout. Um, and they've really formed in terms of the Timberwolves and their lack of chemistry. Uh, the the commanders have a really good chemistry right now with their rookie quarterback. So McLaren over 62 and a half receiving yards. One of those, maybe a deep touchdown from Jaden Daniels. I was hoping for mine that the, the Wolves stuff would be listed by the time, uh, we recorded this for tomorrow. Yeah, for the, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I guess I don't, it's it's late right now. I uh, thought they, those those uh, might be up there. I, I haven't had really a a chance to look at uh, what the the NFL slate is here. Here's one we were talking about this earlier today. Give me give me for our lineup here. Give me Russell Wilson for more than 226 and a half passing yards. I like that against uh, against Baltimore. Even on Jalen Hurts to get a touchdown. Is that real? That seems like it's free money. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Well, that'll be that'll be our combo here. And look at that. So normally, when we would do a five dollar lineup for four, that would pay. Is that ten to? Normally, that's nine and a half to one. Yeah, nine and a half to one right there. If it's if it's perfect, but isn't isn't that not what? It, shouldn't that be more if there's a, a demon yeah, on there? Yeah, there should be. Something's I, going I would on be here. Told to be no math <laughs> at one thirty in the morning. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, as, as as you know, this is. Uh, this is how, how prize picks works. You put together a, a daily fa fantasy lineup. Uh, we like to do it around a, a Thursday 
a Thursday night football game. Uh, obviously, the by the time you're listening to this, there will be Wolves options that you can do as well. So if you want to pair that with uh, with Kyle's two picks, you can throw. Let's keep putting that ant over three and a half made threes. Think that one seems. I was going to take. I was going to take over on all Nikhil stats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what you're doing. You're just trying to push him into the starting lineups. <laughs> um, it is away. it is uh, fun to, uh, to to play prize picks uh, again, whether it's NFL or, you know, you probably if you listen if you listen to this podcast, you're watching all the Wolves games. You might have a good feel of, uh, I guess, particularly against the Blazers, what what that might look like tomorrow. So check out you know, got points, rebounds, assists, made threes, all sorts of stuff uh, for the NBA ones as well you can go to pricepicks.com or the prize picks app um to to submit your lineup and if you don't have an account uh use the promo code dane and they will instantly credit your account with 50 dollars when you place your first five dollar lineup kyle anything else the the point differential on this show is going long uh no but i i do think it's important because people are going to wake up tomorrow and be upset and rightfully so but the vibe we talked to ant post game we talked to nikhil we talked to Nas. And again, I, I imagine eyes are rolling as I say this, but it is a long season. And I think that is like, that doesn't mean you don't need to have concerns. We just did 40 minutes on a roster shakeup, but I was joking about that Pistons thing. Chris Finch got absolutely out coached by Eric Spolstra on Sunday night. And Eric Spolstra, say, Spolstra got out. And Eric Spolstra literally single handedly <laughs> lost them the game tonight against the Detroit basketball Pistons. And all I'm trying to say is, is that a lot of these teams, like I watched the Mavericks coverage tonight while I was waiting for you. And like, they're the 11 seed and they're talking about energy and starting lineup and lively and all this stuff. It's just, I know that you don't want to hear that right now, but I do think that some of this is just being a teenager kind of in growing pains. And I, I love the process of this because maybe tonight, which was an embarrassing loss to a really bad basketball team is your Jared Vanderbilt, Patrick Beverly moment that kind of, you know, this team isn't going to be what last year's team was. It's not going to be a couple of bad losses to the Hawks and they just go 18 and four. That's not this team. New breaking news. So they have to find a different way to kind of find an identity for a team that doesn't have one right now. And Finch said pregame, these next 10 games, the goal that right. I told these guys, we have to come out of this 20 games. We have to have an identity. And the the Heat or Dallas, like you said, um, any other good team that's, you know, going through it right now. It's like what Finch said about the ant thing to win at the highest levels. You got to get rid of all the lapses. And, um, that is, that is the the task at hand for the next 70 games, uh, for the wolves is to, is to navigate that and, and be like, be a team who's not last year. The wolves were better than most of their opponents. They were not smarter than most of their opponents in, in their games. You know, if we, if we were to do that, like, that that's also true this season and and i want to i want to see the collective iq connection effort consistency locked inness uh let's have that keep going upwards the arrow pointing up because after these last two games it's uh, it's pointing down but they get to play the blazers again who i still think are bad after after that game last night so we will be uh, we will be back tomorrow again late at night to do to do another pod after this game i appreciate you staying up late uh, and doing this kyle uh for listeners yeah next up will be it's it's kyle week we will we, oh, we yeah. will do uh we will do another pod after the second uh portland game and then uh on friday we'll be at treasure island again would would love to see you all there um, but it's it's time for us to go to bed uh for kyle uh you can follow him on twitter at Kyle Tige, I'm Dane at Dane Moore MBA until uh yeah, until Wednesday night. He's Kyle, I'm Dane. Peace out. How I'm feeling, man. I hope it never stop. Yeah. Green it so you can find me in the crowd. Yeah, yeah. Don't let standards ever ever bring you down, yeah.